He's, he's risen, amen? amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We thank you for this night. Lord, have your way, have your will. We thank you so much, God, that you're, you're alive, Lord, that you didn't stay in the ground. Lord, for my soul, for the sake of the souls that are here tonight, we praise you, God, because you have set us free and bridged the gap from death to life. We thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, good to see you. Happy Easter. Did you get your Easter eggs? You can go ahead and cut those on. Thanks, bro. Did you get your Easter eggs all taken care of? You guys dye them and, and uh, do, the, do the hard ones or you do the uh, plastic ones, all right? Uh, I, I love this holiday. You know what? I thought it funny. How many guys like, ate ham today? Ham has become the ham has become the unofficial food of Easter. And, uh, you know, turkey was Thanksgiving, and you hunt it. Justin, isn't hunting season for turkey this month or th- next month, whenever it is? It's right now, okay? So the hunting season for turkey is right now, okay? And the unofficial food of Easter is ham. Did you guys know that the Jewish people couldn't even eat ham? <laughs> Interestingly enough, we've adopted ham. Anyway, nothing to do with the sermon tonight. Just thought I'd share that little bit of information, right? So uh, I want to give you a couple announcements. Tori's usually up here, but I forgot to give you the card. That's my fault. So I'll do it for Tori. Uh, listen, I want to let you know, how many guys watch The Walking Dead? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> how many guys watch The Walking Dead? Look, Mike is like, I'm in. I love that show. All right, listen, here's a new show for you. I haven't seen it, but it premieres tonight. It's supposed to be really good. I'm hearing a lot of good things about it. Multiple people have texted me about it. It's called AD. It starts tonight at 9 o'clock. Have you, got, you heard about it too? I've, I've heard a lot about it. I've seen some previews. Now, I like to see when Jesus people do well at, at cinema photography and movies. I think it's great for Jesus, like Christians, right, to do well at stuff. And I love to see it. So I'm going to check it out tonight at 9. If my eyelids are going to make it, I'm going to check it out at 9 o'clock tonight. DV, if you watch Walking Dead, you might miss it, whatever, but you'll be okay. So it, it, it's not on right now. It's on a break. See there? You're okay. All right? They timed it just right. So AD starts tonight. It's on CBS. It starts at 9 o'clock at night. Also, since you, if those of you that are still looking snazzy, even if you're not, don't worry about it. Ryan Minner would love to take your photo at tonight. There's a photo booth set up with the 1980s tie-dye. And so take a photo tonight and... Uh, Get dapper, all right, and have fun with it, and take some good photos, and we'll laugh at those next week, and uh, it's always a good time to, to do that with the family, all right? So take a photo before you leave, and we will really appreciate it. All right, go ahead and open your Bibles tonight, guys, if you, or, or um, open up your phones. Ryan, can I go down just a smidgen, just a little bit? Thank you so much. Perfect. And guys, we're going to be all over the place tonight, so start in the Gospel of John. Just flip to the Gospel of John, and we're going to be there First, and we're gonna, Abby's going to have some things up on the screen for you, and I'm going to move around as much as possible and get you going a little bit because we all need to move because of all the ham that we ate, that kosher ham that we ate today. So here's the deal, though, guys. Easter, man, did anybody do any Easter shopping? Like, did you go? I, 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 saw, I saw Amber out at uh, we're, Hobby Lobby, we're, and they've got a whole section of Hobby Lobby now dedicated to this holiday. So when you first come in, have you guys been to Hobby Lobby at Christmas time? And the first 18 rows is, is ornaments that, like, I didn't know they made ornaments of, like, bowling balls. Like, you can get a bowling ball ornament. It's just a piece of lead with holes in it. And, like, that's ridiculous, right? So the Easter has kind of become the same thing. Hobby Lobby has turned into Easter madness, Justin. I went to Walmart, and they sold out of plastic eggs. And the Walmart in the section, you guys know when you go into Walmart, and whatever season they're in, they change those first front aisles to that section. It was all Easter. And here's, and, and, you know, it's, in, in Austin, it's like when it becomes commercialized, I'm done. It's like when you start, I, I'm just done with it. It's all commercialized now. So the ham prices go up. The eggs are sold out. I went to Aldi's to buy eggs and they're sold out. They brought in an extra push cart of eggs and put it where the milk normally goes in all these foods. I'm like, really? Like we bought that many boiled eggs? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, what is the point of all of this? But I can't not get into it because that's what the world wants me to do. They want me to get into this holiday of Easter. They want me to get into the bunnies and Easter eggs and junk food and the kosher ham, right? The non-Jewish kosher ham. They want me to get into this. And so what do I do? I respond. I get into it. I'm like, yes, I want to buy clothes for this day. You know what I mean? I want to eat candy for this day. I want to make macaroni and cheese. I had macaroni and cheese stuff planned out, Katie, did I not, for weeks. 
because I was going to make macaroni and cheese for this day, and probably because I want to challenge my brother again to macaroni and cheese cook-off, but he's just, he's not ready for it. But anyway, I, I, I had macaroni and cheese supplies ready for this day, and I got into the commercialization of holiday. And look, dude, I, I found a giant plastic Easter egg at Hobby Lobby, 50% off already. It's 50% off on, on the day before. What day were we there? We were uh, Friday? We were there Friday or Saturday? I can't, Friday, I think. I think it was Friday, something like that. Friday, they got 50% off giant Easter eggs. I'm like, why not? Everybody needs a giant crackable plastic Easter egg. And so <laughs> I, want, I want one. And, so, and then they had candy, right? And I'm like, you know, who, who doesn't want candy for, for Easter, right? Who doesn't want... Who doesn't want candy on Easter, Austin? Who, everybody wants candy on Easter. Abby's like, please, in the name of Jesus, throw me the candy. Throw me, <laughs> please throw me the candy. Ryan, you're going to have to come and get it, right? Jillian, yes, happy Easter. <laughs> How was church? It was awful. <laughs> it was awful. I hate church. I got hit with Easter eggs. Ben Todd, boom. Listen, we, if you want Ryan, come, Abby, come and get it. It's all yours. I don't know. Christian's like, I love Easter. I love it. (laughs) Are you okay? So, Caleb, Caleb, you want some too? Did you get some? Hey, you know, we we get into this. Ryan. I am a horrible pastor, man. That's why, that's why I'm not a senior pastor right there, just because I throw chocolate and, in my services. Oh, man. This is the top of the rung for me, buddy. So I, I, I get into it too, right? I want chocolate for Easter, you know? I want to microwave a peep once a year, and this is, <laughs> this is, this is my holiday to do it, to microwave a peep. Once a year, this is, I know, it's this horrible way for a chicken to die. But I, I want to do, I get into this, right? And for what is it, what am I doing, right? For why, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I hunting bow ties, color coordinating, doing the whole commercialization of Easter? What am I, for eating kosher ham, right? I love it, spending time with my family. I've texted this to the leaders three times this week. He's not just risen today, amen? He's risen every Sunday, Every week, every day, he's Lord. And so this is kind of the one, every church on the, did, I drove to church at 931 this morning, left my house at 931, and on the way to church, I pointed out to my wife how many cars were in parking lots this morning. It was, it was crazy ridiculous, the amount of people that went to church today on a day. And it seems like, hey, everybody's more willing to talk about the resurrection and crucifixion today which is cool with me because I want to talk about it anyway. I'm here every week talking about it. We just get to talk about it double tonight, right? And so everybody in the world wants to dress up. They want to eat their kosher ham, and they want to hear about the resurrection story today of all days. And I'm okay with that, but I want to talk to you about it again, and I want to remind you of five key points about this thing. Five key points about the resurrection, crucifixion, that we as believers, because I feel like all of us are believers, hopefully we are believers, that we need to be reminded of. And it's Easter, yes, it's Easter, there's eggs in the candy, and I get into it, I want to buy the plastic 50% off breakable plastic eggs, but I also want to be reminded that Jesus Christ came to the earth, lived a sinless life, born of a virgin, died a perfect death, and rose from the dead three days later. I need to remind myself this, okay? Because this is the core pinnacle of my faith. This is the crux of everything I believe. Here's the deal, guys. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter at work. It doesn't matter at home. It doesn't matter what I do up here on the pulpit week in, week out. The crux and pinnacle of my belief system is the crucifixion and resurrection. Would you guys agree to that? Crux and pinnacle of what we believe is the crucifixion. So I can ask you tonight, What do you believe about the resurrection? Here's the deal, guys. It's 2015. Does anybody in here know people that don't believe this story is real? We do, right? A lot of people that don't believe that this is the fictitious account of what happened to our Lord, that they're going to try to rationalize the fact that nobody could really come back from the dead, and they're going to say that this is not possible for a man to die and come back from the dead. What do you believe about the resurrection? Was it a real man with a real death and real life? Fundamentals, okay? We don't practice to hit home runs. We practice basics, running to first base, catching ground balls, okay? 
Fundamentals. All right, so we're going to go over a couple points tonight. If you look in your notes, I've got more notes than you've probably ever received in your entire life and less time to cover it, but it's okay. With the grace of God, we'll make it happen and get you out of here before 9 o'clock. Here it is. We believe that Jesus Christ came to earth, like I said, lived a sinless life. Jesus Christ came to earth, was born of a virgin. Jesus Christ lived out a life of purpose that ultimately led him towards the cross of Calvary, led him towards a perfect death on the cross where he was crucified. Thank you, Benjamin. And he, and he led, uh, was led uh, by God in the act of faith. Uh, and, and you, you know, I don't know what you believe about Jesus growing up, but he was perfect, right? We, I don't even know if he like split his Cheerios. It's like, hey, watch this, and you know, split the split the Cheerios. I don't know if he walked, practiced walking on water before the day he did it, but he was perfect. However, he did it, he was perfect in the way he got there. We know that Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross, right? We believe that Jesus Christ was nailed to a literal cross. It wasn't new pro- practice for the Romans to have a cross. It wasn't new practice for them to crucify people. Jesus was actually crucified on a real tree with real nails. Here's what we believe, John 15. 15, 12. That's where you're at. You're supposed to be at. John chapter 15, verse 12 says this. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And here's the cool part. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You guys have ever heard that verse before? And anybody, ever, anybody heard that verse before? Greater love. Here's what we believe. Number one about your notes. In your notes, it says this. One of the awesome aspects about the crucifixion is that Jesus laid down his life and allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. Okay. Now, this isn't the nail that was used. This is a railroad spike. Okay. And this would definitely hurt. But when Jesus was nailed to the cross, right, what do you believe about how he got there? What do you believe about how he got there, okay? Do you believe that the Roman centurions powerhoused his arm down onto the wood, tied it there, and then nailed it? What do you believe about this, okay? Here's what I believe. When the Bible says that he allowed himself to be nailed and laid down his life, I believe that Jesus Christ crawled onto the wood, okay? I believe he, he laid down his life and put his arm out to receive the spike, Okay, put his arm out to receive the spike. Now, here's the deal. A lot of people say, well, Jesus Christ suffered under the weight and was just fearful in the Garden of Gethsemane about the nails that were coming, about the agony he was going to go through. I believe this, that the captain of our faith is no wussy, right? He's not a wuss, dude. So in Garden of Gethsemane, I think what he was foreseeing was the weight of sin and God's wrath, not a spike. He allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. Well, can you picture this? How many people have you ever met that would be willingly nailed to a cross. It is unfathomable to think about. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. That's our first A for tonight, and that's what we believe. A nail, right? He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. Remember letter A, no one took his life, but he gave it up. Do you believe that? No one took the captain of our faith's life. He gave his life. No one took it from him. He's not a wussy, okay? No one took his life. He gave it up. Mark 10, 45 says this, the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to serve and to give his life away as a ransom for many. I love that. Give his life away. John 10, 11 says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life up for the sheep. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? Did he give his life up for you, for me? Good things for us to be reminded of. Here's the deal. It helps me serve God on a day-to-day basis when I know he gave his life for me willingly. It helps me to know that a man came to earth and did not deserve to die, had a spike driven through his hands and his feet willingly. That is an unimaginable thing. Can you, listen, can you imagine as a mortal gearing your mind up for this process of what you would go through physically and spiritually? Can you imagine gearing your mind up to allow a nail to go through your hand? I, I can't, I can't do it. I can't get there. I cannot get there, but he allowed it to happen, okay? That's what we believe. Letter B, we see his heart for humanity when we realize that he allowed everything to happen to take place. Everything that took place from Garden of Gethsemane in his life. Listen, we believe that he allowed it to take place because here's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26. You guys remember when he came to the garden and they're like, who are you seeking? Uh, And he said, "Uh, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, right? And he says, I am he. Gospel of John says they fell back. They met the power of God. And then Peter is like, what's up, homeboy? <laughs> right? It wasn't like that. He had a sword back then. But Peter, wanting to defend his Lord, <laughs> pulled out his gun, his sword, and, and went slashing, right? And he cut Malchus's ear off, the servant of the high priest. And Jesus picks up the guy's ear in front of all these Roman soldiers and says, Peter, put it away. Unload the clip. Put it back in the magazine. Whatever. Right? Those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26. He says, do you not think if I wanted to that I could call down legions 
right, of angels to come and defend me. If I wanted to, I could, I could stop this. Isn't that what Jesus is saying right there? He's no wussy. He's a king. Right? He's always been a king, right? And he says, do you not think if I wanted to that I could call down legions? And here's what I believe about this verse. Would God have postponed the inevitable crucifixion if Jesus would have asked for it? Would he have? He said, if God, if I would have wanted to, God would have moved this, changed it, play, or not changed it, it still would have been the crucifixion, still would have been the death, the atoning sacrifice, but it would, God would have answered it. He would have said, I, I, he allowed these things to happen. He allowed it to happen. He allowed every fist to come out. He knew it was going to happen. He allowed it to take place. That's what we believe. Let her see. Jesus surrendered to death. He was not defeated by it. Isn't it kind of cool, right? Jesus surrendered to death. He wasn't defeated by it. Understand this, man. Mel Gibson couldn't really show us what this is really like. I wish he could. He did a good job. He did a good job. But Mel Gibson can't show us what this is really like. The Son of Man surrendering himself to the wills of evil men. Wiles of evil men. I don't, wills and wiles, whatever. They have a will, evil will, and the wiles of the devil. Anyway, right, so Mel Gibson can't show us what this was like, okay? He can't, he can't portray this, okay? But he did an okay job. And here, here's, here's the deal. You guys, have, how many guys have read all four Gospels? All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's a, it's a cool story, but here's the deal. There's more to Jesus' suffering, more to what he allowed than we let on. Some of us think that he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went before Pilate. Pilate washed his hands. He was beaten in front of Pilate's men. Then he went to the cross, okay? That's partly true, but I want to give you the gospel account. Here's, here's the deal. According to Luke chapter 23, you don't have to put this up, but, but Mel Gibson doesn't show all this stuff in the Bible. You have to read all four gospels to get it. He allowed multiple things to happen, okay? Multiple things to happen. Let me give it to you like this. What time of day was it when he was arrested? Nighttime, because they had just had this, the last supper. They went into the Garden of Gethsemane. You're correct. It was nighttime. He was arrested. Where did he go from the Garden of Gethsemane? I'll give you a hint. Peter was watching here when he got arrested that night. He went into the court of the high priest, good job, and was warming himself by the fire of the high priest. And remember, the servant of the high priest says, I recognize you. I recognize you. So went to the high priest's house with Annas and Caiaphas, okay? That's whose house he was at, right? There is, do you think that Caiaphas and Annas were important enough to have soldiers at their disposal? Obviously, they arrested Jesus. They had to, so did he get beaten the first night? Did he get beaten the first night? Okay, I believe he did because they, they hated Jesus. They hated him. So they beat him the first night, held him till morning. Who knows what happened that night, right? Who knows what happened that night? Here's what happens. He wakes up. He goes before Pilate. Pilate's men have a heyday with him. He allowed all this to happen. Pilate's men have a heyday with him. And then all of a sudden, Pilate realizes, hey, Herod's in town, and it's Jesus and is not of my jurisdiction. Sends him to Herod. This is what you got to get from all the Gospels. Herod's men are upset with Jesus because Romans hate Jews, okay? They, any opportunity they get to beat on a Jew, they do it, right? So they have their way, and they get even more upset because Jesus wouldn't perform for them. It says Herod wanted them to perform and do some kind of miracle, and Jesus wouldn't do it. So Herod's men beat him. Here's the deal. Six-mile walk back to Pilate, because Herod says, I got nothing to do with him, sends him back to Pilate. Here's where it says, they went to the place called the Praetorium, where the gladiators perform, and it says the whole garrison came out. Here's where they do crown of thorns, cat of nine tails whip. Um, cloth on his back being ripped off and mockery. Say, prophesy, son of man, who is punching you, right? And they have their way with him then. And then it's still not over, and he has to put the cross on his back and do the way of suffering, the road to Golgotha, everything he allowed to happen. So it's not just he went before Pilate and suffered. He went before multiple people in, this, in the course of that day, suffering each from, uh, from each person, allowing it to take place. The Bible says this in Isaiah, that he was marred beyond recognition to the point where you didn't know it was a man. If you were from the crowd, you say, is that even a man over there? Because it, so, it was so much suffering that they had, they had inflicted. Every ounce of hatred, when you get anti-Semitic things going on and the aggression of an entire garrison who had nothing to do being poured out on one man they hated. It says it was unrecognizable as a man. You can find some of these things in Luke chapter 23. Then he took the road to Golgotha and it says he couldn't even carry the weight of the cross it bore down on him. They had to get Simon the Cyrene to carry it for him. He allowed these things to happen. Number two in your note says this, another awesome aspect of the crucifixion. It's not awesome in the sense that it was suffering, but it's awesome in the fact that he went through it. Another awesome aspect about the crucifixion is that he willingly endured the agony of the cross and the added weight of sin for the sake of our soul. The wooden cross. He endured 
the agony of the wood cross. And we've already led up to that, where he was at with all the, all the men and where he was at with all of the soldiers. He still had to be nailed to the cross when he got there. On top of all that, he still had to be nailed to the cross. We believe that the captain of our faith willingly endured the agony and the added weight of sin for the sake of our soul. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us run with endurance the rate Grace that is set before us, laying aside every weight and sin that easily ensnares us. And look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the agony and the weighted, added weight of sin. I have this in your notes, letter A. It says this, the agony of the cross and what he suffered was nothing compared to the agony of our sin. Now, here's, here's another doctrinal statement for you. You don't know what you believe about this, but here's a cool little concept. Maybe not cool when you actually think about the ramifications of it. But when he, it says that he was poured out and, and that sin was poured onto him, do you believe that Jesus Christ experienced the ramifications of sin during that time? When sin was poured on him, did he experience the thoughts of hatred? Did he experience the thoughts that somebody goes through during murder? Did he experience sin? right? It's a crushing, crushing concept if you think about Jesus Christ enduring some of those things, the weight of sin that came upon him. So when a killer thinks the thought to kill, did he experience the thoughts? Did he endure the thoughts? Hard to, hard to fathom and get your head around, right? The agony of the cross was nothing compared to the agony of our sin. Let her be, it was the weight and agony of sin that crushed him. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 says this, he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him as stricken smitten by God. Like this is just another guy that has bad luck with God. That's what people esteem him as. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we become healed. It also says in Isaiah 53, 10, I have this in NIV, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his land. It it pleased the Lord to crush him. Listen, the way to sin crushed Jesus Christ and he allowed that agony to happen. That's the second A. He allowed that agony to happen and endured the added weight of sin. Not just the people punching him in the face. It was the way to sin. Let her see. Understand the agony that he endured. He endured it so that he could bridge the gap between heaven and humans. Isn't that a cool concept, man? that Jesus Christ endured this added weight of sin, not just people punching him or whipping his back, but the added weight of sin to bridge the gap between heaven and humans. He made a way when there was no way. Amen? He made a way. So they killed him, right? They killed him. You guys know the story. I don't want to make light of it, but due to time, we're going to, what time? Oh, we're good. We're okay right now. I got to move fast. But they killed him and they uh, stabbed him. And it says that blood and water came that uh, basically medically that means Uh, Mike, you can correct me on this, but his heart had exploded, it ruptured, and that's where the blood and water would come from in this cavity. So when they stabbed him, blood and water came out. And uh, we we could do the study on Leviticus 14 and talk about the correlations and similarities there, but it's a really cool thing. And so so his heart exploded, they stabbed him, blood and water came out, then they took him off from the cross. They didn't have to break his legs. That's prophecy. It says, none of bone in his body shall break. And usually when they're hanging on the cross, I've illustrated this before, they would push themselves up to gain breath because they were pinned by their feet and they would use how their feet were pinned to push themselves up. But in his case, when they came by, they saw that he was already dead. And so they usually, to kill him faster, they would break their legs legs with a hammer or something so they couldn't push up on their legs anymore they didn't have to do it with Jesus because they saw they was already dead poked aside took him down from the cross and here's the cool thing another bible study another time Joseph of Arimathea do you guys know who Joseph of Arimathea is he's a council member and a Pharisee unlawful for him to touch a dead body it would have made him unclean came and asked for the body of Jesus and sacrificed his place as a Pharisee and as a Sadducee and as a councilman to wrap the body of Jesus. Interestingly enough, according to the Gospel of John, guess who else helped Joseph of Arimathea take the body down? Nicodemus from Nick at Night, John chapter 3, right? Nicodemus, who was scared to come to him during the day, came at night asking his spiritual questions, was bold enough now to ask for the body and defile himself as a Pharisee and wrap the body of Jesus. Cool little Bible study, another place, another time. But these two men came and got him, buried him in the tomb. What do you believe about Jesus? Real body, real tomb, right? Real body, real tomb, buried him in the ground. And here's the cool thing. Guys, we know the end of the story. The earth shook. I don't know how it happened, but the stone rolled away, okay? Without hands, rolled away. And it says that 
he rose, and it, dude just came up out of the clothes. And I know Lazarus has got a cool story, but Lazarus died again. You know what I'm saying? Jesus came back from the grave, all right? And we believe this. And this is what I believe, that Jesus Christ is alive, all right? And we know that when he was dead for three days in the ground, he went and preached to the souls in hell according to the Ephesians, and then led captivity captive, gave gifts to men, and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. Number three, another awesome aspect of the crucifixion is that death didn't win, and Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. So can you imagine Mary running to the tomb? Okay, and when, the, when she gets there and sees that he's gone and sees this white linen cloth, this, you know, it, it wasn't like this, okay? It wasn't like this. It was, maybe it was wrapped like a body was still in it, and it kind of just deflated because they would embalm like the Egyptians, okay? And that's what, they, that's what, that was the practice. So maybe it was wrapped like the body was still in it, but it was just flat, okay? And it, it, it's like he just kind of came out of it, you know, like, you can't hold me. So she came and finds this, and death didn't win. He is alive. That is our third A for the day. And early on the first day of the week, John chapter 20, verse 1, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance and that he was not there. Letter A, I love this. Our faith would be as false as everyone else's if Jesus was still dead, right? Our faith would be just as bootleg as everybody else's if Jesus was still there. But he's not. He's alive. Matthew chapter 28. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Amen. Amen. He's risen, man. You know, and it's not for nothing. Like what we're going through, what we're doing in life, it's not for nothing. Because he's still, he's alive, okay? And guess what? Because I believe he's alive, I believe he's coming back for me. And you and those of us that are calling on his name to be saved. I believe he's coming back because he's alive. He's a real person. He's alive today. It says we'll be able to touch where the nails went in and see the places in his side. I can't wait, okay? Real person, alive right now. Don't, this is so crucial. I don't want anybody to miss this. Let her be in your notes under number three. It says this. Don't ever forget the days in your life where Jesus being alive was just awesome. Okay? Don't ever forget the day as a Christian. Don't ever get so sour in your faith that you forget the day where Jesus being alive was just stinking cool, man, when it was just awesome enough for him to be alive, all right? Matt, Mark chapter 16, verse 6 says, don't be alarmed. You're looking for, for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified, but he is risen. He is not here. You can even go see the place where they laid him. He's not here. He's alive, amen? Let her see God raise Jesus to life with his mighty power. That power now lives in us to quicken our mortal bones. If you are a believer, you know what I'm talking about. But because of time... We're going to go quickly. We're not going to marinate much on that. He's alive, guys. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. He lives in you. So Lazarus' story is pretty cool, but again, Lazarus died again. Jesus didn't. Number four, another awesome aspect about the crucifixion and resurrection is that the price was paid, and he purchased our individual access to eternal life. You'll have to wait just a minute for the words to come up. N number four blank is this, and he purchased our individual access. Access is the fourth A. He purchased our individual access into eternal life. Here's the deal. If Justin would have died, it would have just been a man dying. If Nate would have died, it just had been a man dying. If Caleb would have died, it had just been a man dying. But since it was Jesus Christ, it was enough right? Here, I like to think of it like Jesus wrote a huge check and it cleared, right? It didn't bounce. He, he, he swiped a card for the sins of all humanity and it, it took, okay? It didn't bounce. He paid for, listen, what you believe about predestination and election doesn't matter at this point because he paid for every soul, right? So when we think about, am I elected, am I saved, predestination, he paid for every soul, okay? So he can decide if it's election or predestination. I, I'll say this. I'll even go as far as to say this. It is predestination because he paid for everybody, whether they take it or not. You know, I'll just say that, right? He paid for everybody. His blood was enough, and that's why every ounce of his blood had to be shed, and it was enough to pay for the souls of men to enter into eternity with him. And he did it for you, and he did it for me, and he paid. He paid for the access. He paid for your ticket to ride, and I love that, right? He paid for your soul. He endured our sin and that you wouldn't have to. Here's the deal. When you think about it doctrinally and like metaphysically and spiritually, listen, you would have gone to heaven with the weight of your sin and been denied access, but he took it beforehand so that when you get to the gates, it's paid for. And you say, I've got 
coverage. I'm under the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're paid for. Your, your admit one is okay because you're standing on the ticket that's stamped by Jesus Christ and is sacrificing death. Amen? So cool, man. So cool. Letter A, he cried, it is finished from the cross when the payment was satisfied, when it was done, take to less die. I've done an entire sermon on this, and I love it. It's paid for, paid in full. John chapter 19, uh, you have to just flip there, old-fashioned style. John chapter 19, verse 28 through 30. The reference is in your notes. You can look it up later. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said to, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put the sponge full of the sour wine on hyssop branch and held it in his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said this, it's finished. Te It is all finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It's done, man. He paid for the access, right? Came back to life, paid for the access. Let her be. Jesus counted the cost and paid the total price for our souls. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, you were bought with a price price of his blood, right? Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death, and Jesus paid with his life. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son in entirety to pay the bill for our sin. On top of all this stuff, it's, it's not even that in the least, man. Here's the coolest aspect. Number five, lastly, it says this, another awesome aspect about the crucifixion is that when he was resurrected, God highly exalted him, exalted goes in the first blank, and acknowledged him as king and Lord. Now here's, guys, what, I got these cool little jewels right here, right? The cool thing about this whole thing is that he endured the agony, right? He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. He paid for the access for us to go into heaven. And now God has acknowledged him as king and Lord, okay? It says this in the Bible. Uh, Philippians chapter two, you guys know these scriptures, but I wanna read it to you again. Philippians chapter two, verse nine through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, when he rose from the dead, can you imagine, three days later, right? Three days later, I don't know how time works in heaven, if it was just like instantaneous or not, that time-space continuum thing, doesn't matter. But when he finally came, and I love preaching this, man, it's one of the things I get so amped about because the, the Psalms talks about who may ascend the hill of the Lord, right? Who may, who may ascend? And it says this, lift up your head, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Picture gates, real gates in heaven. And as a man right, walks up to the hill of the Lord. David says, who can walk up to the hill of the Lord? A man walks up, right, a man. And it says, lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, and the king of glory shall come in. And from the other side, there are created beings who are sinless in heaven, not been on earth, and says, who is this king of glory that dare approach the hill of the Lord? Who is this king of glory that dare lift his hand and knock on the door of the Lord? And he said, it is the king of glory, the Lord strong in battle, the Lord mighty in victory. Lift up your head, O you gates, and be lifted up, and the king of glory shall come in. And so the doors opened because it was Jesus, because it was him, and the sacrifice was paid, and the doors opened for a man, doctrinally, a man, because you can touch his hands, right? And it, doors opened for a man, not somebody that's been in heaven before, I mean, uh, that's st that was still already in heaven. It was a man, right? And the doors opened, and every single created being in that section behind those gates bowed before the king of glory, walking in as the conqueror of death. Such an amazing concept. You want to talk about return of the king, right? You want to talk about return of the king. Can you imagine what kind of created jewels are in heaven that were tossed before the king at that moment? And on earth, what was tossed before him were branches and clothes. It was befitting of him riding on a donkey. But when he walked into heaven, the royal crowns that were tossed before the Lord of glory, and he approached the throne of God, and was seated at the right hand of God Almighty. Whew. Man, he's a king, yo. He's a king. He is called the Christ 584 times in the New Testament. He is not the lowly, humble carpenter anymore. He is the king, the champion, the Christ. He is royalty. The wise men did in advance what each of us should be doing now worshiping the king. 
Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 says this, but Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. He's like, okay, tell us if you were the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power. That's what the Bible says. And coming in the clouds of heaven. Kind of cool, right? And the royalty was tossed out before him. It was rolled out and they threw their crowns down. Even on earth, he said, it is as you say. And from this point forward, you shall see me acknowledged as the king sitting forth next to the power in the mighty hand of God. He's a mighty king of kings. He is now the Lord above lords. That's a cool concept for God to say about his own son. He's the Lord of lords. For those that think they're lords, he's Lord over them. He's the magnificent savior. He's the prince of peace. He's royalty. He is the name that is above every other created name. He is the light that comes into the world. He is the Christ, the king, right? And we declare him as royalty. We acknowledge him as the king that he is, the mighty savior that he is. He deserves every ounce of our praise and adoration and worship. Listen, not just on Easter. On Monday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday again, over and over again, because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Here's the deal. He's going to be king whether we make him king or not, whether we serve him as king or not. He's lord, right? He's Lord whether I say he's Lord or not. He's royalty whether I claim him as royalty or not. He's gonna be sovereign Lord whether I make him sovereign Lord of my life or not. What I should be doing is exactly what the wise men did already, casting my treasures before him saying, God, you're worthy to receive every ounce of who I am. You're, you, are, you are worthy to receive my life. Do with me what you want. You're my king. And I bow and pay homage to you and say, Lord, do with me what you wanna do. I offer my life in service to you. Lord, take my heart. It's yours. You're my king. I serve, right? You're the king of kings and lord of lords. Can I have one of those, um, Tori, wherever they're at? I don't know where they're at. You can just bring it to me. And, and here's what we're going to do. And, and um, I, I wanted to combine some of these things as a reminder. Now, you guys are, are, are my trusted family. I, 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 I serve with you guys week. I know your, a lot of your hearts and I know a lot of where you are spiritually, but I wanted to do this tonight um, as a reminder. I give out tokens and, and things to kind of commemorate what we learn, and I have some of these things combined for you because, guys, listen, I don't ever want to forget that he's king. I don't ever want to forget that he is awesome and magnificent and incredible, right? I don't ever want to forget it. I don't want to stop and, and, and forget and get too busy to know that he paid for my access to heaven and just take it for granted that I'm going to heaven one day, right? So this might not be for you. This might be for somebody else that needs to hear the same thing, okay? You might not already know this, but here's what I've got. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. He allowed it for the sake of our soul. He endured the agony of the wooden cross and the added weight of sin, okay, for the sake of our soul. He's alive, He's not dead. He's risen. He's alive. It's empty. If I can get it out. He paid for our access into heaven completely. It's paid for. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. Okay? Here's the deal. There are thousands of people today who are opening up eggs looking for something cool. Yeah, thank you. There are, there are thousands of people that are opening up eggs today looking for something cool. Maybe somebody needs to open up an egg that really has something cool in it, right? Maybe they need to open up this golden egg, and you need to take it. So that's what I say. It might not be for you. You know the truth. Recap for us. Fundamental drills for us to remind ourselves of who Christ is. Maybe you need to take this egg to a next-door neighbor and say, I want to tell you about the real reason why there's life today. The real reason, because the eggs, it's about life, okay? Eggs, reproduction, that's the twist of the world. But it's all about new life in Christ. So maybe as we leave, Tori's going to have these. And maybe as you leave, you take this egg and you take it to somebody and say, I want to tell you the real story of why we open eggs today. So when they're looking for something cool like jelly beans in an egg, you can open up an egg and show them something really cool. Hey, he allowed himself to be nailed, okay? He endured the agony of the cross. He paid for our access into heaven. He's alive and he's acknowledged as King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to tell you about the king. He's alive. Amen?
Take an egg before you leave. We're going to pray. The guys are going to come on up. We're going to worship tonight. We're gonna, listen, we're going to worship the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and declare that he's worthy. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. I thank you so much for Easter. Lord, I thank you for Resurrection Sunday, Lord God, that it's not a futile holiday that we celebrate, Lord God, even though the world wants to take it and make it their own, Lord, and everything they want to do to it, it's all good because we know the truth, Father, that you came back from the dead, that you saved our souls, that you purchased our life with your blood. And God, we thank you. And tonight we praise you as king, Lord. We praise you as the prince of peace, Lord. We praise you because you're worthy to receive, God, that no one else could have done what you did. And it make the same difference, Lord God, and it count for what it counted for with you. So, Father God, fill us up tonight as we worship. We praise you. We bless you. We say that you're worthy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys worship the king with me tonight.